town was divided into two parts, into a western and eastern part. The western art developed following this early Christian traditions, whereas the eastern part became known as the Byzantine Empire of the East, and they both have different style characteristics. So they become the early part that leads into the Romanesque and later. So during this time period, after the fall of Rome, we see a triumph of Christianity over paganism. So the subject matter changes quite drastically. We no longer see depictions of the ancient gods, but we see the influence of Christianity and Christian beliefs. So the subject matter becomes filled with the stories of the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, the apostles, the writings of the apostles. It becomes a whole new set of symbolism that creates the iconography of the Christian faith. When we look at the stylistic characteristics, we notice this compilation of both Roman art, Roman and Greek art that I showed you earlier, and Celtic art actually. Because the Celtic art of the north of England, Germany, became part of what was seen in early Christian art. During the Romanesque time, we had another change in their political and social structure. We saw the rise of what was called Christendom and feudal society. And when we say feudal society, we are thinking about the idea that there is a king who rules by divine right over the other classes of people. And feudal society was very stratified. You would have the king and you would have the church. And early on, the king was both the political and religious head. Later on, we got the uh, division of that to the political and to the Pope. And under each of those parallel social structures, you would have the king and his nobles, and the nobles would be given land in trade for loyalty to the king and in exchange for financial support in the form of taxes. And the base of this structure was, of course, the peasant or the farm worker that worked for the Lord who owned the land and uh, supplied the income that the noble needed to pay his taxes to the king. And this was paralleled in the church where the church was set up in terms of monasteries where the monastery itself became kind of like an independent functioning mini society where there were areas for learning and because of the monasteries uh, a lot of the ancient learnings instead of being lost at the fall of rome were kept and maintained by the monasteries through the copying of these old documents and manuscripts Within the monasteries, they also uh, had industry. For example, uh, they would make wine and beer for the monks who lived there. They would often have hospitals that cared for the sick and needy that were in the community around the monastery. And then they also, it was the center of worship and learning. And these monasteries and the cathedrals and churches they built in cooperation with the power of the king, these became the structure that held society together. During the Gothic period, what we see is a rise of the merchant class and the rise of towns and villages that were independent of the king and the church. And they started to to become independently wealthy through trade with other centers of learning Cathedrals became the cultural centers of town. So when we look at Gothic art, we don't see a lot of 
different areas like in Roman homes they had sculpture and they had wall painting but in the Gothic time period the predominant art forms were found in the cathedral and those were like the building itself they were like the stained glass windows the sculptures on the cathedral everything evolved around the activities of the church and the cathedral the building of a cathedral was the joint venture of both the church and the town. Both were raising money and funds to put into these buildings. So here we have an idea of early Christian art. It's called a syncretic style or synchronism, which means that ancient Greek uses for the pagan gods were sometimes modified for the Christian God. So they adapted classical styles to Christian belief and thoughts. And this is a time when we get the origination of Christian iconography. And we're talking here about the shape of the cross. We're talking about the shape of the fish. We're talking about the lamb and the figure of Christ as a shepherd. So in this time period, the connection between Jesus as a shepherd and being depicted as a shepherd became part of the attributes that we would see in sculptures to let us know that this was the Christ figure. And what's interesting here is you can see an early Greek statue in a similar pose, carrying a calf to market, to being borrowed to create this Christian interpretation of that pose. Here we have an example of Byzantine art. If you can remember from earlier, I told you that when the Roman Empire fell, it broke into two pieces. And the one side became predominantly one version of Christianity, and the eastern side became another version. And this is typical Byzantine art. And you can see that the style is very different. There is a very flattened sense of space that emphasizes the glory of the rulership of Christ and of the king. So here we have a depiction of Christ the ruler in the apse of a Byzantine church. This is Justinian, the Emperor Justinian. Uh, it's from a mural in the church in Ravinia in Italy. And you can also see that he is depicted as a ruler with power, less than as an individual per We see the use of gold everywhere, which also is the sign of the spiritual world and spiritual authority. There was a great loss of interest in the natural world in both the East and the West, and the king became Christ's representative on earth. The technique that we find here is what we call mosaic, many, many little stones glued together to fill in the color and shading of the forms that are being created. So here you can see the little gold tesserae they're called, and you can see the use of various colors to try to give some dimension to a form, but it's not really accurate. The most believable part or naturalistic part is this part of Justinian's face. Often in Byzantine art, you will see a halo, and it depicts the saintliness or holiness of the person in front of it. The next stage we look at is called Romanesque art, and Romanesque gets its name from the way the Romans built their churches and windows. With the rediscovery of Rome and its ancient buildings and ancient artifacts, the building techniques of the Romans came to be used throughout Europe. And the main characteristic of Romanesque art are these Roman style windows, which are a rounded top. And the windows are rather small because they could not open up the walls to let in as much light because they had no way of displacing the weight of the roof. Part of the Romanesque church was the crucifix form here which is the shape of the cross interpreted as part of the building. And this gets modified and expanded in Gothic art. We have the tower in the center, which becomes higher and higher. The Wester work towers on the west side of the church. That's very typical of a Romanesque 
and Gothic cathedral. Here inside, we notice that the columns are lower and thicker and that the light isn't as expansive and flooding. The only light we're getting are from the apse up here. We always have what's called a nave where the people sit and then these aisles at the side which allow for people to progress up to the front and to the chapels. Well, these churches would have often relics of revered saints, the splinters from the cross of Christ, bones of the disciples, such things, that they were often kept in these reliquaries, which are very, very fancy to hold these precious items. You'll see this reliquary is very, very beautifully decorated. Pilgrims would come to visit the relics. The relics were thought to have miracles attached to them. This is the uh, Saint Lavoy reliquary, Lavoy, and she was a young woman and she became a Christian and she refused to renounce her Christianity, so she was put to death for that. She became revered and a saint. And so this is in con. This is one of the famous churches people went on pilgrimages to. They're holy places and are very important in the life of a believer. These pilgrimages became so popular that the monks became overwhelmed with the number of people that wanted to come to these sites, interrupted by the people coming to the chapels where these relics were held. Another thing typical of a Romanesque church is what's called a tympanium, and that's above a doorway or entrance. A tympanium showed the last judgment. Often you will see Christ enthroned in the center, and Christ will judge the good and the bad, or the saved and the fallen. Those who believe in him will go to heaven, and those that don't will be thrown into hell. And if you can get really close to this, on this side there are all sorts of devils torturing the poor people that have been sent to judgment. On this side you will see all of the holy people. You will see the disciples. You will see saints destined to be in heaven with Christ. And up here we see heaven with the angels up here. You see the symbol of the cross behind him. See the halo behind his head and he is sitting enthroned in the heavens. And so whenever a person went in the church building, they were always reminded of a choice to make, whether to live and become part of those that believed or fall into sin and be sent to hell. A serious message for a people often dealing with death. The, first, the Black Plague went through Europe at this time. There was very little that people could do other than praying to saints and hoping for a miracle. This time period was very much focused on heaven and getting to heaven. The churches and the artwork fulfilled that worldview. Here we have the Gothic Cathedral, the next time period. These sculptures here are on the portals at Chartres, and you can see they're very naturalistic as compared with the ones I showed earlier. If you go to Chartres, they took so long to build that on one end of the church you will see Romanesque style portrayals of saints, and on the other side you will see these Gothic naturalistic sculpted images of saints. From watching Cathedral, that the changes brought during the Gothic time period, the development of the interior of the cathedral to represent heaven and be flooded with this beautiful light that represented the presence of God. The architects developed the flying buttress to open up the space between the walls so that they filled with these stained glass windows. And so here I have the exterior of Notre Dame, the interior of Amiens, which is all glass. There are no walls. Here we have the interior of Chartres, where you can see the pointed arches on the inside bearing the weight of the roof. 